sky was talking. Hello, everybody. How do you turn this up? Can you turn it up? Hello? Is that better? Hi, can everybody hear me? A little more. Hello, everybody. Sorry for the delay. Glad to see everybody here and also in some overflow rooms <clears throat> that we have. Um, and uh, my name is Ruth Ray. I'm one of the co-chairs for EDRA 50, and we're very happy to welcome you all and to welcome Jan Gell to give the keynote ad, uh, address here. Um, he's actually been to some EDRAs, <clears throat> and he has been given awards from EDRAs, both for Great Places and a book. Uh, and um, as he probably needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him a short one anyway. He's an architect, professor, and consultant in urban design. He's focused his career on improving the quality of life in of urban life and by reorient, reorienting the design of the city towards pedestrian, public life, and cyclists. Um, and he's shaped cities around the world. There are too many to mention. Um, and he's made very significant changes in streetscapes and the flow of people and and uh, in cities and also he's especially in the time of increasing densification and urbanization it's particularly important right now his talk on from Jane Jacobs to livable cities is going to be looking at the course of design research for the past 50 years and in, he's going to also be influencing our world, I think, in the next 50 years, when it's particularly important. And I was struck, I, uh, I looked at his first book recently, and a line in it s stood out to me. It said he was interested, he talked about being interested in everyday activities on ordinary days in outdoor spaces. And he des designed, his work has helped us understand how to research those spaces. It's been really important to the environmental design research field and I was also struck with the simplicity of his ideas. I find that the work that tends to go the farthest and has the most impact can be very complicated but comes across very simple and talks about quality of life um, and also the fact that he takes into account the experience of the person, the people themselves, the sort of the central experience, what they see, what they hear, what they smell, which as everybody that walks down a busy city street knows, when you're bombarded by loud noises and big buildings and there's no pedestrian life and sort of people around, the, the scale really makes a difference and getting out into public space with other people really makes a difference, and design really makes a difference in that. So with that, I'd like to bring up Jan Gell to give his presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I realize that we are busy today, uh, 50 years in 50 minutes. Congratulations to ITRA, and uh, this is not um, the start, this is a placeholder. Um, this is, yeah, this is the start. Oh me, I love ITRA. I've been sitting uh, over in Copenhagen, never been a member of ITRA, but thank you ITRA for the Places Research Award in 1998. And thank you ITRA for the Research Award in 2006 with the city of Melbourne sitting over there actually in Australia. But anyway, thank you, Idra. And thank you, Idra, for the Place Book Award in 2010. I feel very close to Idra, though I've been sitting over there in Copenhagen and watched you with admiration in all these 50 years. I also thought that I had spoken on the second ETRA conference in Kingston upon Thames, only to be reminded that that was not an ETRA, not a proper ETRA. It was just architectural and psychology conference. 
but the Edra, I think I spoke then an Edra number four in, Ca in Lawrence, Kansas. Could that be it? Lawrence, Kansas, number four, 73. It could be, could be four, yeah. Okay, this is not the subject. We'll start right away. Um, this is a T-shirt issued by the Danish Architectural uh, um, uh, Center. And it's some, something about that architecture can change the world. I always question that, and there's a question mark here. And we can uh, put the question here, what if environmental design research can change the world? Question mark. And now we start. And it is on the importance of putting people first also in city planning. The whole journey from Jane Jacob 1961 till Times Square was transformed in 2009, 10 years ago, and actually right up to now. This whole thing has a background. That is some of the things going on in the 20th century, the second half of the centuries. We had two old planning paradigms. One, of course, was modernism. Um, in, uh, started in the 20s, developed in the 30s with the CIM Charter of City Planning in Athens, 1993, where they finally decided you must never put housing, recreation, workplace, and communication together, always separated. And you must never make cities always make freestanding buildings. You must never make public spaces always make grass because that's better for the people and that will prevent a revolution and barricades and all that stuff. <laughs> um, parliament of the street stems from streets, so don't do it. Um, modernism, there were many good things in modernism, but they, it got more and more extreme. And as from 1960, I would say that was a time when they really rolled on modernism because that was a time when all the cities around the world had to expand because of the big migration from the countryside to the cities. That was when the whole exploded and modernism was ready for mass production and they reproduced, mass produced. Modernism also did another thing. They redefined the client. They say that now we have an entirely different species. We have modern man. Uh, actually, they, they said modern man and they meant it. And the cities should be made very, very practical for running full speed from your bed to your workplace and back again for recuperation. <laughs> all the, until this point, all the cities in the world looked like this. They were made for people. They had the human scale and they had a slow speed. People were walking a lot, but not modern man. He was rushing. And uh, so from now on, and also the modernists said, everything before now is redundant, cannot be used because we have a new species. And all this done for the old species cannot be used. So it has to be thrown out, all of it. It was, of course, the biggest manipulation in, in the history of mankind with, with um, uh, uh, human settlements. Before this time, we always have spaces. We built the cities around spaces. In the spaces, we met, we traded, we moved from one end to the other. Everything happened in the spaces, and all the buildings went up to the spaces so that they could be present. And no building was more sort of interesting than most of the other ones. Spaces were interesting. Then came this fantastic revolution where the focus was moved from the spaces for people to the objects, to the buildings. This is Corbusier's take for a better Paris. And to have a better Paris, you have to take Paris down and build 24 high-rise buildings where all the people in Paris could climb up and see how lovely Paris could be. <laughs> what happened now was it was the objects and around the objects was leftover space and they did never realized that leftover space can hardly be used by mankind, not even modern man. It was just redundant space. If you look at an old city, this happens to be Copenhagen, when you think of a city like this one, 
Uh, you think of it as a number of spaces which you know. You know all the spaces, the squares and the streets, and then you know the parliament and the king's palace and the, and the dome and the cathedral, and all the rest is spaces. That is the old cities. The old Nolly map of Rome is very interesting also, 1744, 8, um, where he drew all the spaces in the cities and left all the buildings alone. That was his Rome. Spaces, not objects. It was in 1960 as if there was such a pressure on that the planners went up in aeroplanes to five kilometer height and then they organized all the all the plans by hanging over the models and moving them about you know, and this it and uh, the side planners they adjusted slightly from the helicopters but down there where the people were nobody was asked to look after that scale that disappeared the care for the people scale disappeared with modernism. I call it the Brasilia syndrome. Brasilia, capital of Brazil, big hola boo in, in the mid 50s where there was a big world competition and they made this fantastic city. From five kilometer, it's perfect. It's an eagle, head of the eagle is a parliament, could not be more beautiful. And, and going down at the rooftop to the helicopter, you can see the beautiful monuments by Niemeyer, the parliament, the ministerial buildings, the fantastic uh, art uh, landscape, artworks, the big lawns, da 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 da. Down at eye level, Brasilia is shit. <laughs> they never thought that there would be Brazilians in that one. And never, no one ever took any interest in making the landscape where the people had to move around um, a good landscape, a nice landscape, a rich and interesting landscape, endless paths, no trees and lots of shortcuts through the grass. That is Brasilia as I see it. Very modernistic. Also <clears throat> this celebrating of objects led to this crazy competition between architects about who could make the most funny shape. And they have actually made quite a few funny shapes, but the interesting thing about these shapes is that there is no quality difference between them. There is no evidence at all that they will have better workplace here than there or better living conditions here than there. They just look different. It's like perfume bottles. Same, same stuff in all of them. Um, also, this object fixation gave rise to a new type of architects, the bird shit architects, who fly around and drop towers out of context uh, everywhere. <laughs> to me, modernism. And you, you, you can sense that I don't like modernism very much. <laughs> there were good things about modernism in the beginning, but they soon faded. But modernism really was a goodbye to concern for people um, b between the buildings. All these leftover areas were good for nothing. The other big paradigm which has so much influenced the planning and, and building in the past 50 years in the ETA era, uh, it has been the car invasion. Again, it's an old invention, not so old, but 120 years. But after 1960, it really started to be a real tsunami. And uh, given that we from that time had all these leftover spaces, it was very practical because then the cars could move in and take over the leftover spaces and then they could complete the picture. Also, with the invent, in the introduction of the car, we further lost our ability to understand scale. All this thing about human scale, which is so important for the quality for human beings. Uh, in the old days, all the, build, all the cities were five kilometer an hour scale. The spaces were small, you can see everything, you can sense it, you can smell it, you can see it, you can see the people. But suddenly, 
everything should be made for cars and all the spaces were made for 60 km an hour space with big signs, big dimensions, no details, you cannot see them, no people, you cannot see them either, just suburbia. Ta-da! Then we can ask the question, when all these really took off, what did we know about quality for people in 1960? And the answer is we knew virtually nothing because the modernist has thrown out everything and said it's redundant. Whatever you did for the old species, we cannot use anymore. We need new architecture, new site planning, new city planning, new furniture. We knew everything new for modern men. But we knew nothing whether all this modernistic stuff was actually leading to better quality of life, whatever. The first voice we heard was from 61, was Dane Jake was here from New York. And <clears throat> it's a long story, and especially here in New York, you know it all, that he had this very strong fight with Robert Moses about his great plan of saving New York by taking down New York and especially all the old redundant areas, Greenwich Village, Tribeca, Soho, Noho, Little Italy, Chinatown, off they must go, and instead you should have freeways across Manhattan and along that high-rise buildings. Jane Jacobs lived in one of the buildings in Hudson Street in Greenwich Village, and that was his bad luck because she took up the fight, she fought vigorously with the inhabitants, the plans were, were shelved, they won. And she put down all her experience in one book, fantastic book, um, saying that if modernists and motorists are to dominate today's, the future's planning, it will be dead cities and not great cities. And she also said, to you planners and architects, and ADA members. Look out of the window and see how people really are instead of sitting in the offices and speculate about what they ought to be and, or what you think they should be or whatever. Look out of the windows. Jane Jacobs really is a grandmother of humanistic city planning and she's And she's still around, though she has passed away. I saw this poster two years ago in Toronto. The old days, the end of times, Jesus looks after, but the future, Jane Jacobs looks after. <laughs> the story of my own life. Again, this fabulous year of 1960 pops up. That was when I graduated as an architect. And to me, that was the low point of city planning of all times. What did we do in the 50s in School of Architecture? We spent five years moving objects around <laughs> like this. <laughs> Bingo, this is a good city. And the other half of the time, we bent towards Brasilia, <laughs> which was at that time the, the big event where you actually, you dreamt of being able to do a pilgrimage to Brasilia. Later on, I have done one. I was on crutches at that point, and Brasilia doesn't lend itself to people in crutches, I can say. But that's another story. This is one of the professors we had at that time, hanging five kilometers over his housing area, and he was the one who said, a good housing area is something with looks smashing from the freeway. And this one in Sweden looks smashing from the freeway indeed. I went out to School of Architecture to do all these wonderful things for mankind. Modernism, wow. That was really the future, modern man, she is walking there. Um, then, yeah, then, then I married England. I married a psychologist. And that was the early 60s. And suddenly our home was full of young architects and young psychologists and sociologists and the young uh, social people. They all the time gave us architects a very bad time. And they said, 
Why are you architects not really interested in people? Why don't they teach you anything about people in School of Architecture? Have you thought about why your professors go out four o'clock in the morning to take photos to be sure there are no disturbing people in the foreground of the monuments? And we, we, would, we would meekly try to defend ourselves and they will say, you know so much about what it's all about. You're manipulating with people every day you put any breakdown and you don't know a thing about it. That was a very strong thing for a young man. And to me, it, it, it resulted in me being, having to go back to school of architecture for 40 more years to find out what they didn't tell me in the first round. And only for me to find out that they didn't know a thing. There was no knowledge. The modernists had thrown out all the knowledge. And after a while, I found the book of James Jacobs, but it's mostly there's not so yeah there are advice in that one but there was much advice needed much much whatever i had to sit on my behind for 40 years and the and the method i used from the mid 60s when i started doing research was sitting on my behind day after day and watching what was happening what how people were using um, buildings and using cities and doing it in rain and storm and snow and Greenland and, and New Zealand and Africa and South America and, and China, all over the world, all kinds of cultures, all kinds of climates, all kinds of uh, situations. Just to give you a few little examples, what is this? School of Architecture in Copenhagen, and these are architecture students who know how to behave. But School of Architecture moved to a new premise and they called in a very famous landscape architect. They do some landscaping and then he did some landscaping, nice lawns with raised iron edges, just as you should do these days. What is this in the, in the corner here? That is, that is the corner. I'm not linked. That's the corner. And what's this in the background? That's the canteen. And of course, when the student come across around the corner, and see the coffee, he goes for the coffee. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, but in his training, he should know that he should always go in right angles. <laughs> but even architecture students, well trained, they do just as other people, they go for the coffee directly. And the, the landscape architect, of course, should have known that. It could have been much more interesting if he had observed that little thing and realized students and coffee can't be tampered with, tampered with. So three weeks later, the landscape architect came out to finish his beautiful design. John little example. The other one here is, and these are just little pieces of, a, of not of lots of, of observations done over many years, many places. Um, there's this thing, this basic human thing called edge effect that Nobody really, if they are to stay for a while, stand out in the middle of nowhere. We even call it, he's standing in the middle of nowhere. And if you stand there, you start to move your feet a little bit. And after a while, 10 minutes, people say, what he's standing there for? And then after 15 minutes, they say, we better call the police. Um, so we never do that. If we are to stay for a while, we drift gently over to the edge where we are unobtrusive and they have Life can go, go by and we can stand here for hours and hours and see what's going on. All our senses are out here. Our back is covered. This is a wonderful place to stay. So it's very typical of Homo sapiens based on our biological history. Actually, this edge effect comes from the cave where the caveman is sitting in the bottom of his cave and can see the fire and the two a tiger in front of him which gives him, him great comfort that they are in front. So we go to the edge, we go there, all the Peter Square, everywhere. And then we started to say, what about architects? Maybe they are different. Maybe they don't go to the edge. Maybe they sit all over the place. 
And then we started a big series of research to see how architecture students would be seated in various countries. And we found that architecture students are exactly like other people. <laughs> they are homo sapiens. <laughs> and, and then we started to say, who on earth put out these benches? <laughs> and who would they expect to sit on them? completely against everything we know about people. And um, if you do this, then I recommend you bring bronze people <laughs> to make sure that it is somewhat occupied. <laughs> we, we did a lot of all these systematic documentation of behavior and all kinds of settings. Then you, all the time I meet that people in other countries, they're different. I was in Moscow and saw in Triumph Square some funny behavior here. And then I realized that I saw the same behavior in Washington Square Park in New York the previous year. They're both here and here, homo sapiens. We need an arm's length between us to be comfortable. That's universal. So, okay. Uh, this research, and Inge was at the same time also doing research in the Building Research Institute. She was studying the psychological aspects of housing. And actually, both of us, we had the opportunity to go to the Kingston upon Thames conference in 1970 to present the first draft of our two books, the Living Environment book, which which looks like this, and the Life Between Buildings books, which looks like this many years later. Um, I thought it was Eta, it was not. And so all my work in trying to find my original Eta paper from 1970 is false because it was not Eta. It was <laughs> architectural psychology, it was very close. Then, after a while, my book started to be, to be sort of spread. My, my puny little PhD on life between buildings came out in the most funny languages. And I was especially very happy to see that it was spread nicely in developing countries because I think this humanistic city planning is really what is needed in these fast growing countries. Then later on, Forty years later, I was asked again by these people who, were, who have sponsored some of these things. They said, couldn't you, Jan, sit down and write down everything you know in one volume while you can still remember it? <laughs> we, we did this in nine, 2010. And of course, they, did, they have a special thing, these guys. They, they would say, we know you are very busy. But isn't, isn't having time a matter of how many assistants we can, have, we can offer you? And then after they've done this for a while, you say, oh, okay, 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 I have time. We had time. We wrote it. Um, it's come out now in all the major languages and, um, of course, Arabic and Farsi and whatever, even Greece. Yeah, I sold the Greece. They should not publish it because they have other things to use their money for. In, no, they should not use my, their money on publishing any book of mine. But they said, don't worry, it's a Danish embassy who looks after the finances. So, fine. They need it very badly. But then it also came out in French. Took 40 years for one of my books to come out in French. Did that happen in Paris? No, it happened in Montreal. <laughs> but it is, it is out in French. And now, 10 years later, nine years later, this puny little book about cities for people is out in 35 languages, more to come. And to me, that's not because, yeah, to me, that is a very strong example of two things. That is that there is a widespread interest in having more, sorry about this one, I need some help. Oh, my dear. I need help desperately. 
help is coming. <laughs> yeah, it's for those who are sleeping in the first part. <laughs> Okay, no, it tells two things. One is there is so little available about this subject. That's why, th that, that is, does it work? Uh, that's why such a puny little book can be distributed so quickly to so many places. But also it's a sign that there's really great interest around the world in, in, in humanizing the cities and to me that is very, very, um, uh, I, I'm very moved about this enormous interest in people-friendly cities. There's the next one, how, that's not about what we found out, but how we found out, again it was the same foundation who said, it's not enough you write what you know, you should also make available how you found out. We have done that. Summing up, there is now quite a bit, not fantastic much, but there is quite a bit of literature about making much more humane cities and housing developments, starting with Jane Jacobs and <coughs> all these 50 years, quite a bit. So we know now how to make much better new towns and how to clean up the old towns after the invasion of the um, automobiles so that they can be much better for people to live in and, and work in. What has been found out, I shall do it very quickly because it can only be some examples, but one important thing is that walking is not a matter of getting from A to B. Um, there's much more to walking than walking. Actually, you shall always look in any city about all the people who does not walk because walking may just be that the university and the railway station is too far apart, but if people decide to stop and wait and sit and enjoy, that is the important thing. That means it's a place of quality, and that is what you should look for. And you should realize that walking, actually, being on your feet is what you were born for. Everything good happens when you're on your feet, and in the cities we should look very much for those people who are not walking and make sure many people are not walking. But before you cannot walk, you have to walk, so it's combined. Um, we have found quite a few things. We have found that nearly all the principles of the modernist were sure principles to chase people away from the shared spaces. They actually had no shared spaces. You should do almost the opposite. We found that the details of the projects are extremely important. Here is the best public space in the world, Piazza Campo in Siena. Um, it's 700 years old and it still works marvelously. Is that a miracle or could it be common sense? Of course, over the years we made a number of keyword list of things you should look after to make people comfortable in a space and and um, there is a, a, a row of things it ha has to do with protection against various evils and problems and and uh, irritations and then when all this is gone you have to make it really comfortable so you can walk you can sit you can stand you can see you can talk you can hear you can play and unfold whatever. And finally, there's a number of things about scale of enjoyment, human scale, you should enjoy the good parts of the climate. And then there is this whole number 12 about aesthetic quality and positive sense experiences. But that's just one of 12. If it's, I learned also in, always in School of Architecture, if you make it beautiful, it will work. Shit doesn't. You have to look after all 50, all 12, and then you have to make it beautiful, then it will be sublime. You go back to the Siena Campo in Siena and find that you go in there with this list and come out, not with yeah, 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 but yeah, oh, mamma mia, 
Hey, oh, ah, oh, ah. And when you come to the aesthetic quality, the design, the architecture, then you say, oh, fantastic. When you can put all these things together beautifully and nicely and with good design and architecture, then you can have the best space in the world. Of course, we have continued this research. Here is an example. What happens if out of 12 quality criteria you overlook 13? We found a square which have done that. And what do people do in that square? They run out of the square as fast as they can. It takes 42 seconds to run out of that square. And that is the activity there. And we found another square always in a, also in a new town where all the quality criteria were observed and here there were all the time 10 times more people present. They were sitting, they were enjoying, and they were not running out of the square. They were coming from all over the city to stay in that square. A destination in its own right and a place to run away for full speed. That's just the difference between looking after people or not. Summing up this part. I have been for 40 and more years doing research and making books and we realize that by making books and doing research you can change the mindset and you really, we, I really have fel felt that we have been able to change many mindsets with our research and our books. And then of course if you have changed the mindset then you can start changing the architecture, the projects and the cities. Da-da. Um, while all this research was going on, also, there were increasingly new challenges and new changes also in the planning paradigm. As of today, uh, when we show any mayor in the world this here and say, would you like a lively, livable, sustainable and healthy city? He will say, oh, that's my program. That's my program. And that is far different from the programs they made in the end of the previous century. We need, and I'm not developing this further but man is a social animal we also always had other people as our major attraction the thing we are most interested in we always had the, the spaces the shared spaces as a place where the lowest level of social interaction watching and hearing and and experiencing life and people were taking place there was ideas that we can all do with digital information and we cannot. And we still, we still have so many successes with real good public spaces where people can meet. And you can see as a sure sign that any way, any time an architect firm deliver any project, it's full of happy people out in the public space doing all the kind of things they'll never do there. But that is a sign that that's really a sign it must be a good housing area since all these people have come out. If it wasn't good, they would go home again. Here they have not. So we need the public spaces as we have always had throughout the history of man because we are social animal. We have realized that we our mobility and our, our transport is changing and we realize the more we bike and, and walk, the better for the climate and we will have to have more and better public transport and that will again be dependent of good public realm. Public realm and public transport, they're brothers and sisters. We have a new challenge also in <coughs> with the sitting syndrome, which is called the new tobacco in America. Um, first they have to get rid of the tobacco to survive now they have to get rid of something else to further survive. We know that there are many people <coughs> in, in a number of states, also in Europe, who die out of sitting syndrome. The doctors know that people living in suburbs, they die earlier than people living in cities. Because in cities you walk more and there are more stairs 
In suburbs, you drive more and there are more cars. And all these put together, you die a couple of years earlier. We know that having one hour of moderate uh, fitness uh, exercise a day, not fitness, moderate exercise, walking, bicycling, you can live seven years longer and have a much better quality of life in the old days. And we know that it's much, much cheaper for society. And that is why now, after we have built cities for 50 years where people were forced to drive as much as possible and sit as much as possible, now World Health Organization say, make everything so that people walk and bike naturally in the course of their daily day. If we look carefully into people, if we are sweet to the pedestrian, sweet to the bicyclist, we get a more lively, more livable, more sustainable and more healthy city. And that is really the order of the day. Then we can ask, are there city in this world who invite people to walk and bike as much as possible? Yeah, increasingly cities all over the world is doing this. I will not have time to take you on a big tour to the cities where I have worked in, in my several years of, of, of working after being an academic. Melbourne is a fantastic example. Work started 85 and they have by far made the best city in the southern hemisphere. It's always in the very top of the list of most livable cities. And if you don't know what to do, move to Melbourne. It's, it's a quality like Paris, but the weather is much better. Sydney we worked in and were hard work getting the cars out of the city centre. But after six years we have succeeded. The major streets are now pedestrian with light rail, hard work. There's this case about New York. The, yeah, the, uh, Michael Bloomberg, he said, I'll make New York the most sustainable metropole in the world um, in no time to speak of, that means while he was still mayor. And um, then uh, they came to Copenhagen to be inspired. And whatever, they came back and started to introduce bicycle lanes and city bikes. And there was, then there was this question, there was hardly any good public spaces like we have in Europe, in New York. And then we started to question, do you really need Broadway for traffic? And all the traffic planners said, yeah, indeed. And the mayor said, check it and then it came out a year later saying we, we don't need Broadway really traffic will be smoother if we don't have Broadway then that was opened up to close Broadway and then we had in 2009 in the spring it looked like this and later in 2009 Broadway looked like this and before I leave Broadway I will say I was uh, uh, Times Square I will say I was down there yesterday and I almost regretted that we helped to close Broadway because it had developed into the most hilarious combination of the market in Marrakesh and a, and, and, and a, a camping ground and, a, and a, a, fa a fair. And it was so full of silly objects. It was so awful. And they should bring in a god and have him clean up the, the temple so that people can have space to use the space again. It was appalling. I hope you hear that, de Blasio. <laughs> the other cities are also well on its way. Here, the mayor of Vilnius say, don't park in my bike lanes. Here in Bucharest, in Romania, they have a little bit of a problem, but now my book has arrived in, in Romanian and very shortly they will sort this problem out. I told about these various cities at a conference in Montreal and this little stocky man, not so little uh, by the way, came galloping up and said, I'm the, I'm the deputy mayor of Moscow. We want to humanize Moscow. When can you come? And then I've learned already to say, we come on Monday. And uh, then we went to Moscow and I was with my people. I was completely shocked because it appeared that freedom from communism was the right 
to park everywhere without any rules. And the city was completely inundated, and there was parks in the car in the par there were cars in the parks. There were cars on the monuments, on the stairs, all over. This is, yeah, I could tell you a long story about it, and how we. So, oh my dear, what happened now? <laughs> Help is needed. We were a little bit filled up there. Here we are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have no time to tell you what a miracle was accomplished by. M they did well in, in New York. It took s s six, seven, ten years. In Moscow, they did twice as much in five years. And um, we got the cars out of the parks, we got benches into the, we, we widened the sidewalks, we, they even put up swings all over the city. And uh, when I went back to Moscow last year, they said, oh Jan, rascal you, we have a new problem in Moscow, the baby boom. It's, it's because of humanistic city planning. <laughs> I'm very proud of having, being caused to baby boom in Moscow. It's a much better city now, and it's a miracle. But the real good guy in the class is Copenhagen. And they are, were about the very first to start. Copenhagen, you see it here, it was never ruined in the war. It was not ruined by the city planners in the 60s or by the traffic planners in the 70s. It was more or less left over until they started to come to their senses. And in 1962, they took the took cars out of Main Street. Nobody believes it would be possible. It would be the end of the Main Street, the end of commerce in the city. And we were Danes, we were not Italians. And next year, there were no cars, and we started to be Italians. And we have become more and more Italians ever, every year. It was quite a big success. And it was very, very early. It was at the time when Jane Jacobs was fighting with Moses over here. The politicians in Copenhagen took out the cars and say the people need more space in the city. This is how the city looked in 62, and this is how the city looks like. Now the city center, all these spaces have been pedestrianized or, or treated so that pedestrians have a much better quality. And there's been an interesting thing here, that is that throughout this process, the university and the city has worked closely together. Actually, Copenhagen became the first city in the world where the life of the city was studied and documented as carefully as other cities documented the traffic in the city. And we did it in the university, we did it as research. City was not involved, but very soon city came running down to university and say, what do you know about this? What shall we do now? And after another while, they came morning, do you have enough money for your research and things like that? And they just took off. Um, and when, when I finished as professor, I got this nice letter from the mayor saying, if you guys in university had not provided us with all this documentation about what people use cities for, we politicians would never have dared to make Copenhagen the most livable city in the world. We did a lot of work there, and looking back now, I can see that in these 50 years of ETA, there has been, as far as I can see, three important schools of studying the relationship between city and life, city life. There's been the New York School with Jane Jacobs, William White, and now PPS, Project for Public Spaces. And there's been the Berkeley School, Alexander, Cooper Marcus, Alan Jacobs, Bosselman, Abeliard. Um, and then there's been the Copenhagen School. Um, and if I look at these three schools, it's obvious that the Copenhagen School, we have continuously for 50 years studied 
this and published all the time. Also, when life changed, we, we did new books. So it was possible all the way to follow. Copenhagen has been the center of our research, and it's had a tremendous influence on the development of Copenhagen because they could base that all the time on research done at the university. One book after the other, this was one of the EDRA laureates, whatever it's called. We can see also that this development is not sort of pedestrian or not, because there is there, there are several phases. The first phase was now people should be able to walk and promenade without being run over. And the next thing is, 20 years later, you can't walk forever, you have to sit. And then they started to look after much more after the sitting. That was the time of the ca cappuccino, uh, spreading of the cappuccino um, culture around the world. That was also the time when people have a bit more money. They had traveled and seen that having a holiday, you sat in a square in, in Italy and had a good time with a drink. And also tourists were coming to Copenhagen and to other places. And tourists don't walk all the time. They want to sit two-thirds of the time. So all the squares were cleared of parking and all the furniture went in. And also with the sitting came the culture, all kinds of festivals and and uh, theater plays and opera festival, jazz festival, gay parade, all kinds of, of people and manifestations started to be using all these nice spaces. Second phase. Third phase where we are in now is that everything is done to promote people to be some more active, do swim in the harbor, do roller skate, do bicycle more. All these things are now uh, also part of what they do with public spaces. Now they're into the force, that is climate adaptation. We have had several new incidents of extreme climate, downburst, cloud bursts, and instead of water running into the cellars, the basements, they now make whole areas into a sponge so that the whole area is made that it should catch the water and keep it and the squares are made so they will be a lake or wetland if there is a cloud burst. And it will not be in our basement we have the lake, but in our square we have the lake. And the good thing about this is that the same money which you need for climate adaptation is now also available and used so that you have much better recreational conditions in these particular neighborhoods. Copenhagen was the first city in the world to have a policy, a strategy, we will be the best city in the world for people. And they have specific goals for every five years, we shall need this, we shall meet this, we shall meet this. And it was very much about social inclusion, about democracy, about people coming out, use your, our nice public spaces and meet your citizens face to face and we'll have a much better book a much better city. This is the content. Then they all the time and all over the city they make interesting squares and spaces and develop the harbor front and it could be really bad at the harbor front in the, in the summer. Um, almost impossible to get, get through. Um, this is part of the new policy. The old street looked like the one on top. The old, newer street looked like the one below. All the more lane streets were turned into two lane street, one lane one way, one way the other way, median um, street trees, bicycle lanes. This lower street is much easier to cross. It's much more beautiful. It's much more safety. And lo and behold, it can hold the same traffic as the upper one because the traffic engineers are much smarter nowadays. And this is another little trick of this, making the best city in the world for people. That's called the continuous sidewalk. That means that on all major streets, sidewalks are continued and bicycle lanes are continued. And that, of course, and all the side streets, the guys in, with a car in the side street will have to wait there and then he will have to sneak over the sidewalk to get anywhere. I think that's good priority. But better still, our granddaughter, Julie, seven, now 
can walk all the way to school because there is sidewalk from her door to the school door. She will not have not been able to negotiate four streets, but she can go on the sidewalk and some Mercedes Benz will have to negotiate four sidewalks. That's a city for people. What has happened in all these years with this People First policy is that impressive culture of using public space have gradually involved. They are there, they are very nice, they are carefully made, and people come out in their thousands to enjoy them whenever there is a chance. Also, bicycling is part of this policy. Uh, Copenhagen has got a complete bicycle system, had that for many years. With the bicycle lanes are, are are protected by parked cars and there's a curb uh, near the cars and near the sidewalks. It's developed into a complete transportation system. Uh, the critical part in, in any bicycle system is the crossings and they have worked so much with the crossings that they have become, city has become rather safe for bicycling. I know that our grandchildren when they are 12 they can be allowed to go to sports and to friends, whatever, uh, on their bicycles on their own, which is nice to be in a city where you can do that sort of thing. Uh, they have, of course, good bicycle system needs good integration with transport system. In our uh, suburban trains, you can take for free your bikes, and that's very popular. And uh, of course, when you do much to not bicycling. What happens over years? More people bike. And gradually it becomes an important part of life. Everybody bikes. Even a lady from Australia has been found to bike. Um, that means that every the government will bike, the royalty will bike, and my grandchildren will bike. Everybody will bike. And even people who can't bike are being biked. <laughs> and they love that very much. Wind in your hair is a human right. Will you like a bike ride in your old neighborhood? Yeah. And free beers? Yeah. <laughs> Do we have problems in Copenhagen? Yes, we have had for the last 20 years serious problem. Major problem is congestion on bicycle lanes. What do you do with that? You double the bicycle lanes. And they have been in a big program of doubling the bicycle lanes or making extra relief bicycle lanes in the parks to accommodate because it's so much better for the, for the air and the economy. Actually, there can be five times more bicycles on a bike lane than there can be persons in a car lane. So if you can have enough bicycles, it's good economy to make room for them. They also have, have had time to do some little nice things so people can see that you're really welcome on bicycle. There you can bicycle slowly and you can get rid of your ice cream paper here. And there's a little lean by when in the red light where you can lean without having to, to try to find the balance in other ways. Just nice gestures showing you are loved you are invited, we love you. They put up many bridges in the city, and these bridges are made in such a way as to make shortcuts for bicycles. It should also always be quicker to bicycle from one place to another than to take your car. The city are full of these bicycle bridges and pedestrian bridges now, and they are very, very popular. So, what happens if you do a lot for bicycling for a long time? You get more of them. And we now have 41% of everybody who go to work or school in Copenhagen who arrive on their bicycles. So, we could come to the end, I guess, and the lesson from Copenhagen. Giving good invitations, you will have much more walking, more public life and more bicycling. So, welcome guys to the 21st century, and we are not quite through. Because all this people-oriented planning in these cities, and especially in the city of Copenhagen, has of course spread. All the Danish cities do that. And who is this one? 
My grandmother knew this is a minister of culture who is reading her favorite, favorite book. And she said, I took your book, Jan, because the people out in Europe should see what I'm interested in. But what is more important is she is the one who has made the architecture, the new architectural policy saying put people first in architecture. Oh, finally, a little uh, emotional journey. Two years ago, Copenhagen celebrated 850 years. And in this, they had a big festival and they named 10 guys who over the 800 years have formed Copenhagen. There was the founder and the king and Hans Christian Andersen, whatever. And by God, number 10, they went and said, Jan, you shall be number 10 here because we will say that today's Copenhagen has been the work of your team and yourself. I had a busy time. I had a busy time those 14 days to rush around in the city and photograph my face on the, <laughs> on the bus stops and on the metro doors. You can't get higher and in your own hometown. Ho -ho. And what more? My number one com companion, one of my students, one of my PhD students, one of my research people, the girl who made all the d d illustrations for this, the world girl who has helped me when we did New York and who has helped me all over the world. She's now been made the city architect of Copenhagen, so the next 10 years should be all right too. <laughs> what if Eva, what is environmental discern research could change the world? Ha, huh. indeed it can, thank you. There are, there are, oh, oh. <laughs> they have, they have set up a little bookstore out there with some of my books, and as long as they have books, I have pen and will sign whatever. Thank you very much for your kind reception.